Good morning. Anybody tell me what season this is? Let me, let me, let me clarify that. Yeah, well, it's also something else season. Uh, I went to college in Oklahoma. And if you've never been to Oklahoma, I recommend you don't. Um, no, but Oklahoma has a culture of football that is just wacky. Um, and yesterday was a huge day because the Red River, Red River rivalry took place where the University of Oklahoma faced the University of Texas. Um, and I really don't care. Um, I don't have any feeling one way or the other for either team. But it is football season, and, and Dennis, I, I just want to offer my condolences for the, the sad and sorry shape the Broncos are in. Uh, we go for the long run. Yeah, we're, we're hoping we'll get really good draft picks, is what it looks like. Um, but you look at these men, and, and uh, I was watching a debate on Facebook. Um, because when your team doesn't do well, um, oftentimes you, you blame the quarterback and, and you couldn't pay me enough money to be a quarterback in the NFL. Those guys are 350 pounds and they run faster than me. <laughs> and that terrifies me. Um, but what goes in to making a good football team? What does it take? Teamwork, definitely. Yeah, we, we, we find out very quickly that uh, if the linemen don't care for the quarterback, <laughs> bad things happen. <laughs> but, but what about uh, individually? Practice. Practice, okay. Practice. What else? Leadership. Yes, there's got to be skill. There's leadership, discipline. So last year, uh, Clemson won the national championship. I don't care. But they did. <clears throat> Now, let's, let's consider uh, they had a lot of their players returning this year. Um, now, let's just suppose that at the end of the year, you know, they won the national championship. What do they do? What's a, they celebrate. Jeepers, crime, you guys not watch football? <laughs> I don't. I, I, I watched a little, little eight-minute every cool play in the entire thing. And, and I'm good with that. But let's just suppose that after they won the championship, they, they celebrated. And because they so easily won the championship, um, they're the number one team in the nation right now. Number one, Clemson. Um, now let's just suppose that as they uh, come together for off-season uh, training, which includes a, a lot of things that you don't really think about uh, besides weight training, there's also endurance training and, and uh, dexterity training. They go through all of these crazy things that we don't ever really see because none of us were ever good enough to make it to that level. Um, you know, the coaches that, that I had growing up uh, and, and the coaches of my kids as they were growing up, we cheered first downs because we never made it to the end zone. Um, Christopher's first year of football in Texas, they had one first down that year, and boy, did we celebrate. Um, but there's a lot of things that go into making not just a good football player, but a good football team. But being as Clemson won by such a significant margin last year, they determined that uh, they could really kind of rest up this, this off season and, and uh, take it a little bit easier and not push as hard. And, and as football season came closer and the, the official practices started, coach said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do a different training regimen this year. Um, I want to keep you guys in, in top physical shape so we're going to cut back on the practices quite a bit because uh, I don't want any of you guys getting hurt before our, our season starts. So we're going to cut practices back 
And, and what I think we'll do is we'll have a, a really intense workout one day a week and it'll only be for just a couple hours. We might, might even go a little bit longer than a couple hours. But uh, then maybe, you know, kind of dependent on how we feel, we might have one or two more practices later in the week. It just kind of depends what's going on and, and, you know, how you guys are feeling and, and other things going on in your life. And, and then, you know, that we'll, we'll also take some time. Uh, every day we'll take some time and we'll go over the playbook. You know, I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. You guys need to learn it. Go over the playbook, you know, spend a few minutes every day just kind of looking through the plays and, you know, if, if you're of such a mind that you would, um, you know, maybe memorize some of them, that, that would really help. So, um, as they go into this practice season, the guys are thinking, man, this is incredible. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we got a two to three hour practice that is just brutal. Well, I mean, you look at these other guys and they're doing this six days a week. Now, where do you suppose Clemson would be that season? Wow. Wow. Dead last. Now, I'll <laughs> But isn't that what we do as Christians? Paul, throughout his writings, he actually references physical exercises, uh, sports, uh, he talks about running the race with endurance. He talks about running as though to win the prize. He talks about boxing and, and flailing and wrestling. He talks about physical things because that's the best way to correlate to people that understand athletics how our Christian lives are to be. Now, we come together Sunday mornings. You know, we shoot for an hour and a half. We go a little bit longer depending on the Sunday. And, um, you know, that's our intense training, but that's only relative to the rest of the training throughout the week because we don't do intense training anything like the New Testament church did, new, did uh, intense training. Um, and then we think, you know, hey, you know, if, if uh, you know, I, I don't have much going on and the pastor really glares at me when he's talking about midweek meetings, which is why I'm not looking at any of you. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe I'll show up for either a prayer meeting or, or a brother's meeting or a, a lady's a Bible study. You know, I'll, I'll put my time in there and, uh, you know, and then, uh, hey, I, I got this fantastic devotional, um, you know, uh, the daily breads that we have over there, they're great, uh, but that should not be where you end your studies or end your devotions. That should be where you start. It should spur you on to other things. Now, a lot of this has to do with our culture. Our culture has changed dramatically, even from the time I was in school, which was not that long ago. <laughs> All right, I found out who I'm going to glare at. <laughs> Things have changed dramatically. You know, I mean, even 15 years ago, I didn't know the smartphone. 15 years ago, I had just gotten a flip phone, and I didn't want it. Jones still has one. Jones still has one. Amen. That's old school. Does it have a wire? <laughs> okay. We have advance to the place where we have a tremendous amount of leisure time. What's amazing about this, I mean, we have gadgets and gizmos to do everything. Okay. My, my vacuum has a transmission. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, I know it's valuable because if it's not working, my vacuum is just a brick. Um, but we have things that make basic necessities of life much easier. Okay? Um, you go to other countries and you look at their grocery stores. Super One is a mecca yeah. compared to other countries' uh, grocery stores. And I'm, I'm not even talking about third world countries, I'm talking about you know, some, some comparable first world countries. We have such an abundance of material things that we don't really even grasp 
how blessed we are. Um, we live in an absolutely beautiful place. We don't deal with a lot of the things that other parts of our country deal with, much less the majority of the world deal with. Um, we are blessed. Now, to, to encourage this church, I have never in my life, you know, I've been in uh, one church or another for 44 years, 45 years, and um, I have never been a part of a church that was so giving as this church is. You guys amaze me, honestly, because with as small a church as we are, um, when the call goes out, people step up. Um, last week was life chain, and I want to thank those that came out. But it was a little bit shallow of a year for us. There were a lot of people gone, but we still, with our little church, we had more um, people attend than, as far as I could see, all of the bigger churches. Yeah, we, we were the largest, and this was a small turnout for us. We only had 23 this year. Now, that amazes me. That blesses me. Um, when somebody is in a bind and needs help, people in the church step up. Mm -hmm. they, they just do. Okay. So I want to encourage you in this. But there's also another side to this. And this is something that I have been struggling with for uh, quite some time. Um, we have gotten very comfortable with our routine. We have gotten to the point, we have gotten, how's that for English? We have arrived at the point where we are comfortable with, with the, the same old, same old. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad thing except that. What is the church supposed to be about? Okay. Now, now we, a couple weeks ago, we started talking about this, and I'm going to give you some time. I've asked you to uh, dig into the Word and, and see what the Word has to say about the church. Now, uh, when we say church, what pops into your mind? People. People. Us. The body. Us, the body. Yeah. Building. 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 Yeah. Well, what church, the, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, and it just means to gather, to assemble. Okay. That means, uh, you know, we could do it anywhere, and, and oftentimes we do. Uh, when you fellowship during the week, you, you're invited over to somebody's house for a meal, or you invite them over for a meal, which I would encourage you to do. You, you fellowship, but that's an assembly. That's an assembly. That's church. Okay. Now, we know that we are called to be the church. The building is the place that we have church in, but without us, it's just a building. As a matter of fact, this has been uh, a Baptist church, a Methodist Episcopal church, a uh, ladies' card club building, um, a grange, um, and some, some other things. As a matter of fact, if you look at the gable ends up here, you'll see the uh, club and stuff from the ladies' card club still up there. Um, What is the purpose of the church? Let's just talk church universal. Let's, let's talk, talk uh, about the church worldwide. Okay, so um, hang on just a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start making notes. And I'm also going to put initials by the notes. I'm kidding, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Okay, to spread the gospel. To be there for the community. Hold on to that thought, because I want to come back to that. Okay, i got to do this different, because I can't even read my own writing, and that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, there was a spread the gospel, be there for the community, I heard. Yes? <clears throat> Remember what Christ has done for us? I need somebody that can type or take faster notes. Talk it into your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Teach the word. Teach the word. To help people in need. Okay, hang on. <laughs> Worship God. Worship God. Okay, there was one that was said over there that I didn't get a... What, was that you, Laura? Somebody over here to said... help people in need. Help people in need, okay. and encourage one another. Yep. Well, we, we got teach, but yeah, that's kind of a, a little bit different. Okay, now, now let's take a look at these things, because really, when we talk about the church, most often these days, we, we talk about the internal functions of the church, those things that take place within the service. Now, you know, we... How many here came out of... Uh, the Catholic Church. Put, put your hands up high. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, we have at least one that came out of the Mormon Church. Dave, put your, you came out of Teddy. Dave, put your hands up. All right, that's two. Anybody come out of the Lutheran Church? One, two, three. All right, four. All right. Now, those, I, I don't know about how the, the Mormon church does their services. When we attended the Mormon church, I was very little. All I remembered was that I had slacks that were shorts that I wore to church and a, a button-up shirt. And I know, I remember dangling my feet because I couldn't reach the floor. Um, I don't remember anything about the service. Um, but I have been to uh, several Catholic services and to uh, quite a few Lutheran services. Um, a lot of times we look at their ritual kind of with disdain, kind of, kind of looking down on it, frowning on it. And while um, I don't particularly care for that kind of a service, there is a beauty to it that we tend to miss in our services. Now, they have ropes, they know when to stand up, they know when to kneel, they know, need, know when they need to sit. Guys, we have the same kind of rituals in our church. We have things that happen consistently every week. Um, I, I love a lot of the consistencies. I love Nathan blowing the shofar. Um, I love knowing, at least partially, the songs that we're singing. Um, I love the consistency. I'm, I'm very much a traditionalist. I don't like change. I especially don't like change just for the purpose of being different. Okay. Um, I like consistency, and I'm very territorial. That's my seat. Okay. And if you want my seat, you got to get here early. Okay. Um, but, but, as a body of believers, the local body here, our body, and being part of 
the church universal being a functioning part of the, the, the bigger scope of the church, what do we see that we specifically are called to do? Now, inside, <coughs> internally, there are certain things that have to take place, but they're, they're not necessarily have to take place the way we do it, okay? For example, worshiping God. Typically, most churches, when you say, hey, how was your worship service, what do they think of? Music. Yeah. The music service, yeah. And, and that's what they think of as worship. But that's just part of worship. That, that's just part of it. Another part of worship is prayer. Another part of worship is the word. Another part of worship, believe it or not, is fellowship. Okay? And there's, there's a, a, a lot bigger continuum of things that make up worship other than just the, the music part of the service. Um, and, you know, there are churches that play different kinds of music. Um, Richard, can you hear yet? After Wednesday? He's just smiling. He has no idea what I said. <laughs> no, Wednesday night was a different type of worship. Amen. You can say amen. That's okay. <laughs> Can we jump up and down and holler? Yeah. <laughs> um, on Thursday, Thaddeus could not. <laughs> His legs were too sore. Um, now, I left Wednesday night. Um, I, I, I made it through the first two bands, and I made it through the first two songs of, of Disciple, and I had earplugs in, and I had my fingers over my earplugs. And then I actually went outside to see if it was better out there. And I thought maybe the best place for me to listen would be at home. <laughs> <laughs> now, when Thaddeus came home, after having um, you know, Benjamin and Thaddeus and Nathan were there to help set up uh, the band, all three of the bands were some five hours late getting there because of the snow. Uh, so instead of having uh, a good part of the day to set up and tech, check all the technical stuff and all of that, we, they ended up only having a matter of hours. And uh, so we had people volunteer. Um, a huge shout out to Roots. They had a lot of people show up to help. Uh, Julian really came through for us. Um, then the actual um, concert service. Um, I, I greatly appreciated uh, what the, the first group, what was it, what was their name again? Relentless Flood. Relentless Flood. Um, I really appreciated what the, the lead singer had to say and, and share with the people. Um, I appreciated what the second band was. I, I, all I remember is that they're Welsh from yeah. like, from like Wales. Um, not like Jonah, but like the country. I um, really like to dance. Too. Yeah, yeah. Is that what they call that? <laughs> um, what the Bible calls it. That's right. <laughs> we'll talk about that. No, that actually that's uh, that is something that I I believe God wants me to do to break out of my uh, comfort zone. Um, I know one of these days I'm going to dance as David danced, so if that happens, please don't call the police. <laughs> um, but I, I enjoyed what they had to say. I couldn't understand most of it, but I heard Jesus' name several times. So um, Thaddeus came home stoked, excited. He, he really enjoyed the music. He enjoyed the message of the, the lyrics. Um, Kevin Young always, everybody that's ever gone to one of his concerts that I've talked to, he always makes a point to share scripture. He always does a devotion, and a mini sermon, and uh, that too is part of worship, okay? Um, so, the question that I want us to deal with today 
um, there's a couple of passages that, that I have been working off of for, for quite some time in my own, uh, my own walk, my own uh, relationship. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 7. I'm just going to give these to you real quick so you know where I'm coming from. Matthew chapter 7, just to give you background to catch everybody up, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, anybody that has read through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll, you'll be familiar uh, with this passage. Um, so jumping way down to verse 21, okay, um, Jesus has just given them uh, some guidelines on judging a tree by its fruit and being able to discern true from false prophets. Um, and he, he wraps that portion up by saying, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Now, uh, there's this mistaken idea being taught around the world and in the church that we are um, called, we are not to judge. And that's actually quite mistaken. That's incorrect teaching. What we are not to judge is the world because the world already stands a judged. We are to judge the church and we can make that judgment because we know the guidelines that we have. Um, we're called to be fruit inspectors. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it should be pretty obvious when a person is a Christian. I mean, have you ever just met someone and, and just by the way they talk, you know? Uh, and I'm not talking about the people that, that uh, hallelujah everything and, and that's no offense to them. I mean, man, that's great if you mean it. If you're just saying it to fill gaps in your mouth, um, you, you probably should stop. Um, but, we do know the truth from the false. So we judge the fruit. Now down in verse 21, he shifts gears just a little bit. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now remember, when a word is repeated right next to each other, there, that means there's emphasis on it. This is you've got to pay attention. Okay? It's just like when phrases are repeated. Uh, it's to draw your attention to a significant point. So when he says, Lord, Lord, that they're not just acknowledging his mastery over them, they're also acknowledging his mastery over everything because he is the Lord of Lords, okay? So when we see Lord, Lord, perk up and pay attention because this is significant, okay? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, back up again. Let's look at this. Lord, Lord, so what are they acknowledging? <coughs> when, when they say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, <coughs> excuse me, they believe they knew him as their Lord. They believe that, yeah, they believe that he's the boss. He's the authority. They are acknowledging that in some measure he is the boss, right? But he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. Now, um, I'm going to finish this, this right here, and I want to come back. Dennis, remind me to come back to our Christian equation. Jeannie helped Dennis remember. <laughs> um, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Now, now this is something that I see today in church. Um, what they're getting ready to do is present Jesus with their resume. All right? They're getting ready to impress Jesus with the things they've done. All right? They say, uh, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, there's a couple things that I want to draw out in this real quick. First, they're presenting their, their resume. They're, they're presenting their credentials. But you notice in each thing that they do, what do they do it in? Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? Now, see, that people kind of get screwed up in this. I mean, man, they're casting out demons. Okay? So we don't see a lot of that today. You know, mostly we just medicate them. Okay? But, but they're... they're What's, what's the power and authority here? The name. The name of Jesus. Okay? The name before which every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Now, thinking about this name, every time Jesus came across somebody that was, was suffering with a demon, he told them to be quiet because he didn't want them telling the people around who he was. It was not yet his time. Remember? The, the demoniac in the gatherings. He says, have you come to torture us before our time? They knew who he was. Okay? Uh, they called him Son of God. They, they knew who he was better than even really his disciples did at that point. Okay? So, in the name, the name is the power whereby they prophesy, they cast out demons, and they do mighty works. We go, well, why would, would God allow that? Um, well, Jesus said, you know, remember when the disciples came to him, they said, uh, hey, these people are, are, are doing these things in your name. They're, they're saying they're with you. And what did Jesus tell them? And he said, hey, should we make them stop? Okay. Now, now remember the sons of Zebedee? Um, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. Why? Because they wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn up the village that refused to welcome them. That's audacious. Okay. Um, the name is the power whereby they can do these things. And Jesus said, hey, if they are not against us and they're preaching in his name, they're for us. Um, so, so moving down just a little bit further, uh, they've done these things in his name. Now, just, just as a, you know, to compare your, your resume with their resume, um, how many of you, don't put your hands up, don't put your hands up, how many of you have prophesied in the name of the Lord? How many of you have cast out demons in his name? And how many mighty works have you done in his name? That's all irrelevant. Okay. From this perspective. Okay. Because there is a side to this that we really should motivate us to be doing these things in his name. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then it goes down further and it says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. See, they, they thought they knew Jesus and they did to some measure because they were doing these things in his name. And all of these things in, in and of themselves are, are good things. They were doing it in his name. But what was the problem? He didn't know them. And he didn't know them because they were never his. They didn't come to him. They, they never got into that intimacy of relationship. And think about this for just a moment. Jesus had how many apostles? Twelve. Twelve. He had twelve apostles. And those were his, his inner circle. Those were the ones that he invested most of his time, his energy, his teaching <coughs> to. Okay? Now, how many disciples did he have? We don't know. He had hundreds. I mean, you read through the Gospels and, and you start paying attention to the people that were with him and the people that looked after his needs, and, and there's a lot of people that were at some point or another part of his disciples, but there were only 12 apostles. And Jesus knew each of them. He selected them, and he invested time and energy and ministry into them, including Judas. Okay. Including Judas. Um, so just because you are close uh, and, and have a, a, an appearance of relationship with Jesus doesn't necessarily mean you're his. There are a lot of people out there claiming that name that are not his. Okay? A lot of them. Uh, Jesus warned us that, that uh, there would be wolves that come in in sheep's clothing. 
okay, and where to be on our guard. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go down a little bit further. Uh, I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Or in, in some translations, iniquity. Okay. Um, you're not mine. You, you have claimed my name, but I don't know you. you know? Now, backing up, um, I want to go over, for, for the new people that are here, I want to go over um, our uh, understanding of salvation. Okay? Uh, this is drawn from Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I, I put it in a math formula. Um, so if you go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 2, I'll, I'll show you the formula. And, and when we understand this, if we can all agree on this, um, then we'll, we'll understand when I say things the way that I do. Um, so I'm going to start down in verse 8. I'm just going to talk about the passage for the formula. Always, as always, I would encourage you, uh, take time to go back and read the verse, read the passages in context, so you understand why this part is where it is. Okay, so um, I would encourage you back up into Ephesians. Uh, Thursday night, we started a new series uh, on the book of Ephesians. We read the entire book of Ephesians out loud, and it took us, Steve, what was it, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Um, so I would encourage you, uh, you know, you are without excuse now. If you can't afford 15 minutes uh, to read through the scriptures, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> Okay, so down in verse 8, uh, after talking about the coming age, the, the immeasurable riches of the grace uh, of God, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. <coughs> that is, would you bring the water bottle up, please? <clears throat> it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. <coughs> for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, putting this down simply in a math formula, uh, the first thing that we see is it's his grace. Okay, so grace is the first part of our formula. And then, Putting together with that, we see that, that there is faith. Grace plus faith equals salvation. Okay? Now, a lot of people stop right there, but that's not where the passage stops, is it? Because grace plus faith equals salvation, but salvation is unto works. Okay? See, the, the problem with the people that we just read about they didn't have the grace and the faith. They had the works. Okay? Works will not save you. But works will be a part of your life if you are saved. Remember, there are several things. There are two things required unto salvation. Faith and grace. That's it. That's all that's required unto salvation. Okay? But the fruit that you bear as a Christian, there are a number of things that will give you proof positive as to whether or not you truly have grace and faith. Because you will endure says, he who endures to the end will be saved. Okay? There are a lot of people that have an emotional uh, connection with, with uh, Christianity. Um, they had an emotional experience, uh, but they never really received grace. They never exerted faith. Um, they may have gone to church for 50 years, but they're not saved. See, it's, it's really easy to fool somebody when you, you sit in church for an hour and a half a week and you talk to them for maybe 10 minutes a week, uh, you know, just about anybody can, can con you in that amount of time. But when you get knitted into a body and you start fellowshipping, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, Kool-Aid and coffee, I'm talking about being knitted in and getting to know one another, being trustworthy and being trusting, then, then you start to know where people really are. And, and we hate that. We don't like people knowing where we really are because we know all of our failings, don't we? And, and so, you know, um, or 
right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you an embarrassing story. Okay, and this is a this is a fresh one. Um, so Friday, Thaddeus had to go to work, and uh, I had gotten up earlier. I wasn't feeling well, so I went back to bed, and I was laying there listening to see if he got up, and I I hear him get up. And I hear the door open and close. I thought, okay, well, he's taking Molly out. And then I hear the door open and close. Okay, he came in. Then I hear, dum, 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 as it goes down the stairs. Well, oh, that's weird. Why is he going down the stairs? Huh. Now, not very long later, I hear the door open and close again. What is he doing? Then I hear running down the stairs again. Dum, 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 dum. Because they come up slower than they go down. You know? And this, this happened like four or five times. I'm thinking, what in the world? So I get up, uh, and I was wearing my normal bedtime attire, and uh, I came around the corner of the hallway saying, what in the world are you doing? To see Shay Lynn standing <laughs> <in> the <laughs> I had completely forgotten that Benji and Shay were coming over to pick up the trailer. Um, pray for her healing. <laughs> so far, you're the only one of my, my daughters-in-law that has had that experience. I'm hoping it remains that way. Um, but see, see, I wasn't ready. I was not prepared. I, I, wasn't, I didn't have my mind set on what was supposed to be going on. I was frustrated because Thaddeus, now when he goes down the stairs, he's loud, you know? And when he comes up the stairs, he's loud. And, and uh, why in the world did you need to go up and down the stairs like six times? He didn't. So I was not prepared for what was really going on. I was, I was operating in a measure of ignorance, wasn't I? Um, that ignorance was very quickly... Uh, addressed and corrected. Um, you see I made the pun there, addressed? Because I ran right back to my room and put on shirts and pants. And, um, now, we have got to be aware that our salvation is completely dependent on the work that Christ did on the cross. See, the cross is the, the fulcrum for everything in all of history, and it is the fulcrum for everything in our lives. Because okay? there should be before the cross and there should be an after the cross. And there should be a marked difference at the cross. Okay? So as we, we are moving on from the cross, we should become something else. We should give less and less of ourselves and have more and more of him. The, the goal here is that when people see us, they see him. Okay? That we would be the, 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 the we would model Christ likeness to them. Okay, um, keeping in mind that we will never do it perfectly, but we must do it increasingly. Okay, so this is our, our salvation. Uh, we are required unto work. We're, re we're required unto um, endurance. We're also required unto um, obedience. The scripture also said, uh, you know, they came to Jesus and he said, why do you call me Lord? You don't do what I say. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty blunt. Because elsewhere, he says, you call me Lord. And that is true. That is right. Because I am Lord. Okay? So he is Lord. And we know from Paul's writings that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, I believe the, the spiritual realm, the demonic entities know who he is and they know what he represents and they hate the fact that at some point, because think about this, when, when he was a man working on earth, a hypostatic union, fully, fully man and fully God, they were already acknowledging his lordship. Already. Okay. <coughs> Just, just think about the dread that is on them for what's coming. Because the first time he came as the lamb, okay, like a lamb to be slaughtered. Second time he comes, he's coming like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I don't, I, you know, I, I've been through animal parks and I've been to zoos and I see lions and I've, I've watched the, 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 um, you know, documentaries and and the big cats and. Um, I've never seen a lamb that scared me. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, 
um, I was very grateful when we went to the uh, wild animal park in uh, San Diego. Uh, I, I was very grateful to be inside a vehicle while the lions were outside the vehicle. Um, there is not much that you can do um, in the face of a, a charging lion that is going to deter them. And when Jesus comes back, now I love uh, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Uh, I love when uh, Aslan is, is bringing himself to the, the white witch and she starts uh, trying to tell him his place and the law and man, when he roars, wow, wow. When Jesus comes back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, it's going to come with a shout of the archangels. It's going to come with a, a, a blast, a trumpet blast, and with the word of his mouth, he will slay his enemies. We, even a lion falls very short of what it's going to be like when he comes back again. Okay? So, obedience. When, when we read his word, we understand, look, when it says, don't do this, don't look for ways to do it. Okay? Because immediately, I mean, okay, murder's a sin, right? Okay? Um, so, uh, we understand that that's wrong, but gluttony is also a sin. And gossip is also a sin. There is no such thing as a little white lie. Okay? A lie is a lie. Okay? Stealing is a sin. You know? You pick up a pen and you know you take it with you. Um, except for the ones that are like attached. Um, I, I've never taken one of those with me. <laughs> and, and quite honestly, I am guilty of, of taking pens usually because I forget I'm holding them. Um, but most of them have their names on so I can bring them back. Um, we start rationalizing and, and we have a hierarchy that we set in place to make acceptable and non-acceptable sins. Okay. Now, what is it that separates us from God? Sin. Sin. Which sin? All of it. Any of it. Any of it. There are sins that I have never committed in my life and I probably never will. But there are other sins that I still commit regularly, and I still struggle with. Okay, um, I am dependent on the Spirit of God to help me overcome these. All right, and so are you. Okay, um, so with, unto salvation, faith plus grace. As a result of salvation, according to this passage, the works that God has prepared beforehand, so that we should walk in them. But also, in other passages, we see endurance and obedience. Okay, so, um, I'm going to stop the message there for now, because next week we're actually getting into um, the gifts. Has, has everybody here taken the spiritual gifts test? Yes. Anybody that has not, put your hand up. We've got copies back there. One. You have one at home? Pat? You have one at home? Do you know where it's at? Is it filled out? Not that. Homework. Okay. So we need one for Pat. Was there somebody over here that did not have one? Needs one? Okay. We, um, Satch. We need one for Mike and Joe. You have to give them two because you can't use her answers. Don't you use her answers. And then over here, right here. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Pat over there. Anyone else need one? I have a question about mine. We'll get to it. Don't, not, not this week yet. Hold on. Hold on. Um, again, I would encourage you, there are three passages that deal specifically with the spiritual gifts. Um, I would encourage you to spend some time in those. Uh, if you don't have them from the last time, Ephesians chapter 4. Can we get one more? Uh, I'll, I'll just give them to you now. You can write them down. I would encourage you to go read these chapters, specifically focusing on the spiritual gifts. Uh, Romans chapter 12. 
and 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry? It's already on there? Oh, we'll just circle it then. Uh, anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. So those are the three main areas that we see spiritual gifts. There are some that, that are dealt with in other passages, but they, they are kind of repeats of these, these three different lists. I uh, also want to make sure you understand these are not exhaustive lists. Okay? Um, Paul is not trying to list every gift that God has given, but he's trying to give us an idea of the gifts God has given for the purpose of, of building up the church and, and reaching out. Okay? All right, um, 